Oh, how I love thy law, the law of God. That's what the psalmist says, how I love thy law. Is it an accident that the book of Psalms, the hymn book of the Bible, the only hymn book that we have that was breathed by the Holy Spirit, the inspired hymn book, the much neglected hymn book that is actually God's word, word for word. The biggest chapter, is it an accident, I ask you, that the biggest chapter in the book of Psalms, the hymn book of the Bible, is dedicated, it's a hymn designed for instruction to young people in the Hebrew alphabet, a hymn to God's law to the value of God's law. Christians have this ancient heretical idea today that has its roots in the Marcion heresy, one of the earliest heresies of the Christian church that divided Old and New Testament, divided a God of law from a God of mercy as though they were two different persons. Marcion flat taught that there were two different gods, that the God that was the father of Jesus Christ was not the God who who, for instance, slaughtered the um, uh, firstborn of Egypt, who destroyed the Edomites, that this was a different God. He could not reconcile them in their mind, in his mind. And so he was led by devils to create a different God and overlay his false teaching on the word of God as though that were somehow possible. And we laugh at him. Nonetheless, this, this thought... For those who are not studied, for those who do, and this was the problem from the beginning. You will be susceptible, just like you can be susceptible to a virus or to a bacterial infection if your immune system is not built up with the necessary nutrients and antibodies. You can be susceptible to theological heresies. You can be susceptible, in other words, to lies about God that will damage you in body and soul if you don't feed on the word of God. Imagine this word from Genesis to Revelation as a pasture, if you will. We're the sheep, and this is, this is our pasture. And the Holy Spirit is the only one who can guide us to, to what we need at any particular moment to, to be feeding on, to be feeding on. And there's different... They're all good, and they're all from the same source, but there's different sorts of grass in this pasture, if you will. There's different, um, different words. Not, it's all one word of God. There's no conflict between the words, but there are words appropriate for different occasions. And the context that the Jewish people had, the context that all the authors of the New Testament had for everything they said was in the vast majority of cases being raised from their youth, particularly Paul. Even the ones who were illiterate heard it through their ears, through the oral tradition of the Hebrew people, of the Jewish people, raised from their youth, cooked, steeped, their minds had been impregnated with what we today call the Old Testament. They simply called it the Scriptures. The writers of the New Testament refer to what we call the Old Testament as the Scriptures. There was no New Testament then, except as it was being written, they were beginning to receive the letters of Paul, the letters of Peter, as equal, uh, equal in authority to Scripture. But here's an important caveat. Equal in authority. They are, in fact, Scripture, the, the letters, what we call the New Testament, but revealed at the appropriate time. When you remove the New Testament, brothers and sisters, not that it's impossible or that it's wrong to, to read. The book of John is written so that it's possible to, to read it and, and get a, the truth of the word of God, even if you've never read the Bible before. Okay, I'm not denying this, but speaking generally, and this is a very important warning. I can't overemphasize this. If you willfully read the New Testament and ignore and willfully ignore the context that God spent thousands of years creating for it, which is what we call today the Old Testament, the scriptures, then you will 
be susceptible to being uh, deceived into a false interpretation of the things that are said in the New Testament, particularly some of the more difficult passages in the New Testament, because, because it was never intended to be presented as a standalone. It's like, imagine walking into uh, a theater in the middle of a, an orchestra playing a beautiful, beautiful composition written by a master composer. And you walked in right at the crescendo. You're going to hear something, maybe it's the most beautiful thing you've ever heard. And maybe you're awestruck by it, but it is impossible. And, and, and you could still be moved by the beauty of it, but let me explain to you, it is, it, it is truly not possible for you to understand what you need to understand about the significance of the crescendo, which takes place in the last three minutes of the 25-minute song, unless you were there paying close attention during the 23 minutes that built up to the crescendo. The 23 minutes that the, composition, the composer was using to prepare your mind, to prepare you to understand what he was going to do at the crescendo. Every note, every beat, every pause of the crescendo was designed by the composer to convey a context, to bring to fruition, to bring to completion a context that he painstakingly spent a lot of time and effort preparing your mind to receive in everything that led up to the crescendo. And there's a perversity, while it's not wrong to hear the crescendo, and to be moved by it, even to love the composer and to have a relationship with him. There's a perversion when, when, when someone willingly says, I will hear only the crescendo and I will go back and I will refuse to listen to the entire song in such a way that I allow the context that the composer desired to create for the crescendo to define the crescendo and give it, impregnate it with its meaning. You see, the Old Testament took place, and this does not, this, and I am not denigrating the New Testament, but nonetheless, as a re matter of historical record, and more importantly, as a matter of the record of God's planned revelation of himself in time and space, the Old Testament took place over thousands of years. The New Testament, like a, like a golden capstone on a, on a huge pyramid, took place over a hundred years, less than a hundred years. This is the fulfillment in the New Testament of everything, and it cannot be overemphasized, everything that the, New, the Old Testament, that the scriptures had been leading up to. But the trouble is happening is that people are throwing out the moral law of God. They're throwing out the moral law of God as though it were obsolete. What Hebrews tells us is obsolete. What, he, what the book of Hebrews, the letter to the Hebrews, tells us is obsolete is the ceremonial laws of the Jewish people, the temple laws, and other parts of the New Testament, the book of Galatians and other writings of Paul, clarify that, that we don't approach God through the peculiar ceremonial dietary um, and feast day laws that were given to the Jewish people anymore because we approach through Jesus Christ as our high priest. But people, the Marcion heresy and other forms of this heresy, straight from the bowels of hell, have acted like somehow that they can extrapolate from that. And Peter warned us not to extrapolate from the writings of Paul beyond what Paul has said. We cannot extrapolate from this that the moral law of God by no means has been abolished. By no means has the moral law of God been made uh, obsolete. By no means. We cannot improve upon it. In Matthew 5, when Jesus said, I tell you the truth, he said, Verily I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot, not one jot 
not one tittle of the law of God will pass away until everything is fulfilled. So we see we have a fulfillment of the dietary requirements that were laid on the Jewish people, but the moral law of God, for instance, the law, why are we ashamed of the law? I'm not ashamed of the law in uh, Leviticus that defines uh, uh, sexual relations. Which ones are lawful? Which ones are unlawful? Do you think God has changed his mind about that? Do you think now that because Jesus has uh, risen from the dead, now I can sleep with uh, my father's wife or my sister? Do you think now I can allow my animal or my machine or something to hurt somebody? I run over somebody with, their, with my car and I can just uh, hit and run now because, well, I'm saved by grace. This is folly. This is crazy. We would never apply these things to ourselves. And yet, people have backslidden back into the Marcion heresy. I'll speak to my own country, the United States of America now. It is filled with Marcionism. People throwing away, and this root has been in Christianity for a long time. The devil's been at work. But nonetheless, the law of God is rock solid. Everything that's not ceremonial, let me just make a blanket statement here. It's not complex. Everything that is not ceremonial, everything that is not dietary, everything that is not a peculiar ordinance of the Jewish people designed to help for their temple worship or for their peculiar role as God's um, missionaries to the world is still valid. Everything in the law of God, the moral law of God is still for today, for everybody. That was the commission of the people of God, to restrain people from sin by preaching to the nations the law of God and also God's merciful loving kindness. And we preach that through the gospel now. But the gospel cannot properly be presented outside the context of the moral law of God. And listen to me now. Don't let, I'm not, don't let me lose you. You cannot, through human tradition, through your own thoughts, through Catholic tradition, through uh, whatever your peculiar denomination, you're not going to improve on the law of God. Not one jot or tittle morally. All you do is you play right into the devil's hands when you allow the least part of... Look at the sexual confusion. Look at the destroyed marriages in this society. Don't you think that... When will we decide to say, hey, <laughs> I tell you what, my household has decided already, even if it's just me alone. It's not, but even if it got to that point, I'm going to act like the word of God, in this day and age when the government says a baby can be murdered, when churches approve these things, when you have every conceivable notion possible, the most heinous things you can imagine, homosexuality, sodomy being touted as marriage, what, in the middle of this utter chaos and utter collapse, people are looking at the symptoms, I'm telling you, this is the root, disdain for the law of God. Oh, how I love thy law. Oh, how I love thy law. That's what the psalmist says. Do you love the law of God? I challenge you. Study it. And when you find something in the law of God that you don't understand, instead of applying your own thoughts as though they superseded the word of God and the thoughts of God, even if it takes you five years or, or your whole lifetime to understand it, if you fall down on your knees before God and and say, Lord, I, I don't understand your law, and until I understand it, I'm going to be submitted to it. And don't you add to the law of God, and don't you, de don't you detract from it. What do I mean by that? When human beings, societies, governments, individuals, take the decision to improve on God's law, to forbid things that he permits, and to permit things that he forbids, they are doing the work of the devil many times doing it in the name of Jesus Christ. Look at the chaos around us. Think I'm crazy? You're not going to improve on the law of God. The law of God is good, converting the soul.